All right. So we're really excited for the next portion of our day today. We're coming up to the panel discussion and these three wonderful people, um, we've been in contact a couple of times before this in preparation. They're amazing. They're super interesting. They all have such great backstories um, and also coming from three very diverse and different backgrounds and experiences. So I'm excited to be facilitating this session um, and I'll just grab my notes so that I give them justice while I'm introducing them. But on the panel today, we've got Casey Dykes. She's the co-chair of the Students with Disability Leadership Collective at SBA. Uh, she's also studying a Bachelor of Aviation Management at UNSW. Yep. <laughs> Casey is a proud Awabakal woman growing up on an Angus cattle farm near Lake Macquarie. Studying a Bachelor of Aviation Management, Casey accumulated and revoked four expulsions from the program since 2017 due to a complex illness. These illnesses accounted for over eight months in hospital and 42 surgical procedures between 2017 and 2022. She is now one of the founding exec executives of two advocacy university groups with two successful industry internships, all whilst maintaining the highest grade point average of her life. We're really excited to hear from Casey today. We'll give her a round of applause and then we'll move on to Jana. Great. We've got Jana Logas Swaran. How do you pronounce that? Right. Yeah, great. Jana is the student president of the Flinders University Student Association studying a Bachelor of Computer Science in Artificial Intelligence at Flinders University. He's the current president of the Flinders University Student Association. Jana is also the first international student to hold this position at Flinders University. Originally from Sri Lanka, Jana initially pursued online studies for a year before relocating to Australia in 2021 to further his education. As an international student, Jana feels very passionate about advocating for international student rights. Give a round of applause for Jana. <laughs> and right at the end, we have Lucy Baranowski. She is the chair of the SITSA Student Council. She's an advisory council student representative at Canberra Institute of Technology and doing a certificate four in work health and safety at Canberra Institute of Technology. So Lucy has had a long history of student advocacy, especially within the TAFE space. She completed her year 10 certificate at CIT, going on to complete studies in animal technology and pathology, whilst sitting as the chair on the SIDSA Student Council and the student representative on the CIT Advisory Council, before going on to complete a Bachelor of Nursing at ACU. Lucy has also completed a graduation a, sorry, a graduate certificate in nursing majoring in advanced practice through JCU. She's now studying a certificate for in work health and safety um, and has a strong passion for lifelong education, social justice and community safety. Let's give a round of applause for Lucy. So the purpose of this panel discussion today is to break down barriers um, and build inclusivity looking at equity, better equity and access. So I'm going to take the floor with our wonderful panelists and just double check that you can hear me. Yes. Okay. So there are several intersecting barriers that all students face. We're excited to explore and experience these ones together um, through each of you. Um, so I'll start with Casey very first. Casey, could you please, well, access to aviation for people with disability and university policies in supporting these students um, have led you to facing so many barriers, yet here you are. So could you please share your takeaways from working closely with your faculty? Um, and reviewing university policies that could help students at this summit advocate for their own and other student rights. It might be. Do I have? Yeah. yeah. Guess we... There's a lot of context here um, to how I've done what I've done. Um, I failed seven out of seven units in 2022, which is almost impressively bad. Um, it does get better with the impressively bad. I finished 2022 with an overall weighted average mark out of 100 
100, keep this in mind, of 17. I was told it was irrecoverable. I had support staff tell me I did not belong in this space as I was academically inadequate. And in previous DV history that I had, I was told by my abuser that I would never graduate university and I would never be a contributing member to society. Well, damn her and damn that because I will be and I am. I had the 180 of a lifetime in 2023. I was homeless at the end of 2022. I spent six weeks in and out of shelters across Sydney, both DV and general homeless shelters, um, and time in hotels. I grew up in foster care. I never got my aftercare plan that the state was supposed to provide, which is a legal um, allocation. At the age of 17, my parents that raised me were denied a state adoption. Why? Because at the age of 17, I found out I was a First Nations Australian. And the care system had hid that from my family and I for 17 years. They did some damage, more damage than most people will ever face in their entire lifetimes, in probably the seven worst years of my entire life, between the age of 17 and 24. So as you can see, I was on a back foot. Um, but move hell and high water, I was not sitting down and taking where I was in the gutter and the pits at the end of 2022. I sat down, I begged the UNSW Enrollment Board to not terminate my enrollment. I begged them. I don't even think I could explain to you the desperation of the letter I sent that tribunal. I said, please, this is not me. This is my circumstances. I don't wanna be here. I didn't ask to be here. Give me a chance, please. And they did. UNSW Aviation also moved hell in high water to give me a chance. Pilots have to pass medicals. How much and how often do you think a school of aviation would see someone in palliative care? They don't. But do you know the perks of being a student in palliative care? I don't have to do group assignments. So do you know what? We're gonna take that win and we're gonna run with that win because that's how I entered 2023. I went to Equitable Learning at UNSW and I said, please, I need your help. What can I do? What can you do for me? And they sat down and they took time and they wrote out an absolutely fantastic equitable learning adjustment plan. The problem with that is aviation had never seen an ELP to the level that my ELP was needed for equity of access. I went and I talked to the head of school. I took the time to speak to my lecturers and I explained to them, hey, I might need a little bit of extra time to do things. In fact, my ELP allows me a minimum of two weeks, which is already twice the amount anyone else has allocated. And this is why. I wanna give this my best shot. Are you gonna take a chance on me? And they did. I finished 2023 on an 84 and a 98. The highest grade I got the year previously was a 24. 24 to a 98. 180 of a lifetime. That school at the start of this year, after I was the only equitable learning adjustment plan student for the entire 12 months, we now have seven students on ELPs with a year group size of 80 with three years running concurrently all at the same time. So out of those 240 kids, we went from one ELP student to now at least seven. Brett Molesworth, the head of school, realized that he could not do this. And it takes a hell of a soul to say, I can't do this as someone who is a clinical psychologist and the head of school. To admit that he couldn't do it, respect. He hired Vanessa, Mama Vanessa, sits in that school, she looks at our ELPs and this lady moves damn mountains. I do not know what Vanessa has done to twist that entire school around her little finger, but if she, if she says, get that student recordings, that student has recordings. He got the best advocate we could ever possibly have on side. I have now interned twice in industry. I had to come off medication, hence why I have a feeding tube in my nose, because that medication, I'm held to the same rules as pilots. Staff within my school made sure I had extra allowances because I had to go back onto schedule eight medication that made me more drowsy every day. They moved mountains again. Go in and speak to your teachers. They can't help you if you don't ask, that is the bravest thing I have ever done, is walk to that faculty and say, please, I need your help. I can't do this by myself. 
all of the things they did for me and the work I put in myself, it turned everything around. If I didn't face, and if I wasn't in the pits and the depths of hell, I don't think I would have asked for help. I was so desperate and they came to bat for me. So please, any students facing academic barriers that you think are utterly impossible, the best advice that I can give you is go and speak to your faculty. Go and get that ELP plan because once they have an equitable learning plan in place, don't get me wrong, there have been teachers that have not followed that plan. But do you know who heard about it? Vanessa, Brett, and stuff got escalated to the diversity and inclusion uh, vice chancellor of the university. Um, what's her name? Cara Cross is her executive assistant. I have her phone number. If I need help, I call Cara. She's the best protector person I ever had in my life. She goes straight to faculty and things are done in minutes. Why? No one messes with Cara Cross. Mm -mm. Leanne Holt as well is her boss. Absolute legend. She is on the now on the university chancellery board and she is there to bat for equity, diversity and inclusion. And now with her going and speaking with her, we have now managed to do a whole system overlook on the support services available for Indigenous students at University of New South Wales because of issues that I had highlighted and other students had highlighted to that board of diversity and inclusion. People at uni are there to help you. They're paid to help you. That's their job. They will help. You really just need to ask for it. Go to the Chancellery. Go find your university's car across. And when someone doesn't do your ELP, like it said, you go to your Cara and you say, hey, Cara, I need some help. I have this in my plan and they didn't listen to me. And what can I do? That can also circumnavigate needing to put in formal complaints. Because who wants to sit there and write a 1500 word essay on how much their life sucks right now? It's not exactly fun and it's kind of traumatic. So having someone on the board, like within the chancellery that knows my circumstances, I don't have to write those 1500 word essays anymore because Cara does it for me. I don't have to keep rehashing my trauma over and over because I found my person that knows what I'm going through and her entire job is literally to bat for us. Please find those people within your faculties. Go to chancellery, ask for the help. If you don't ask, they can't do it. There's a lot of teachers that are a lot better than you think. You have no idea. I now have two teachers that have got students, sorry, they've got their own children who are now enrolled in university that have massive disabilities. Two of, the, two of my teachers have wheelchair bound children that are now at uni. I never would have known that if I never had a conversation with them about my own needs. It's like finding those champions, those teachers get it. And I never would have known that if I never asked. Find them, they really are there so much she made me so good job I I just have one follow-up question so it is one thing to go to somebody and to ask but what do you do in the situation when you're getting a lot of pushback from the people who are asking drop their policy right back in their face uh I I started my academic journey in law actually and I have neurodivergence for aircraft so that didn't really last however I learned some skills that I am so grateful for because the minute I get pushed back or someone is not listening to this is why Kara goes to bat for me because Kara knows I'm a policy knowing nightmare and if someone doesn't do their job and she doesn't follow it up it will end up with UNSW legal because I will do that I'm done I don't I don't mess around anymore for example last term I had my group alternative assignment was allocated as the group alternative was the group assignment. I did the work of six people by myself and no one thought it was a problem until I had a mental breakdown mid law exam at the end of the term because I just couldn't, I was burnt out. And then when I turn around and I say, how did this happen? It's, oh my God, how did the policy allow this to happen? And so instead of getting angry at the teacher themselves, because, you know, they obviously didn't have the support to come up with an alternative at the time, we now look at the policy and go back and say, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? And so the best thing that you can do is find the policy and find what should be. Also, go and look on the national standards. You can find legislation on the internet. It's very easy. Go and find your state's discrimination act. 
go and have a look at your university's policy, see what the law says, see what the policy says, and then turn around, go back to faculty, present it back to them and say, no, you and your policy says that you need to do this. So there you go. If you give them the rules, they can't, it's a fact. So know the policy. Thanks so much. Let's give another round of applause for Casey. Thank you. Okay, I don't think this works, but that's all right. So, Jana, you're next. So, international students face many barriers in Australia, things from financial challenges, limited job opportunities, etc. You've had a unique experience uh, and opportunity to support and advocate for international students locally at your university, but also nationally. Nationally, thank you. Oh, great. Also nationally at the Australian Parliament. What is an example of creating opportunities locally for international students and then scaling this at the national level to advocate for broader international student needs and rights? And first I'll ask you to share your story, if that's okay. All right, perfect. So first of all, my name is Jano, surprise, yes. and I am the president of Flinders University Student Association. But today I'm an international student. So in 2021, I started my academic journey in Australia online because COVID and then in 2020 by the end of 2021 I I think I moved on shore um when I came on shore I quickly realized that oh there aren't many jobs for international students when you come on shore because you don't have references you don't have local experience so I had to get my hands on anything and anything I could get my hands on so I started off as a cleaner and also a kitchen hand um because I had to keep myself financially afloat I didn't want to go broke, although I was slightly broke at the time. But um, later I realized that I was being exploited because I wasn't paid the minimum wage. And that's, you know, most international students, when they do come on shore, they don't realize that there is a minimum wage standard here in Australia. And most international students are uh, paid cash in hand. Um, so over time that happened. But on the other hand, I also had to study full time. And I was on a scholarship with a very high GPA requirement. So I had to um, put my time into that as well. So that's when I realized there are other opportunities within the university as well. So I started applying for a few opportunities and then I started working in international education with the university. I worked for recruitment um, to admissions. Although I was a full-time student, I was doing some part-time gigs around the area. And then I worked for student administrative services and also business intelligence planning. So which is around data and computer science, which very well goes with my degree. So, um, but I was also very interested in FUSA student elections. I ran a couple of times, I lost, but the third time I got in as the president of the student association. Um, during that period is when, you know, international education had some major policy changes. Um, currently, if you have seen, it's the ESOS uh, amendment to 2024 Amendment Quality and Integrity Bill, which is currently being uh, debated in the upper house. Um, and I got a short tap from the NUS to, because I had the experience in the international education area, I was working in the industry, but also I was a student association president. So I, I got a short tap to tech the board, and I became an accidental lobbyist. So <laughs> I would like to call myself an accidental lobbyist. So, um, so I went to parliament. Um, I spoke to the Senate um, regarding, uh, there was a Senate inquiry. So I spoke to the Senate, everyone was speaking data, but then I was like, well, data is not just, you know, it's not the only deciding factor. It's also about the perspectives of students. You know, it's about students who are currently offshore, who are currently here in Australia, who's going to go through those struggles. It's about those personal stories as well. And I think, I took that to the Senate as well. Um, over time, there's even more lobbying happening. Um, I was able to meet key politicians. I was able to present myself in different media. Um, so it was a, quite a few effort. And here I am speaking to you today. <laughs> awesome. And what would you say are the primary challenges that international students are facing at the moment? Definitely um, something I'm pretty sure if you're an international student, you can relate is the financial difficulties as an international student. It's very expensive to study as an international student here in Australia, very expensive. And once you move in, come to Australia, and then you quickly realize that you need local experience and referees to get a job, which most of the time, most students will not have 
as international students. Um, that is something that I really find, um, you know, a lot of students find it you know, hard to go day by day, like um, running a student association. We see a lot of international students coming in looking for a food security program and stuff like that. So like, that is definitely a big issue we see with international students. The second thing is the adjustments. You know, when you move from a different country, a different culture, and you're here by yourself and at a comparatively young age as well. So you need to get adjusted to the new culture, new academic requirements, which might have, which might be very different from the country that you come from and learning a new language and adapting and also blending in, which is really hard, really hard. And I think all international students go through this phase of, wow, what I've, I've got myself into, like crash. And then they just pick, uh, pick them up pick themselves up from their own words. So I think that's a big uh, challenge as well. Yeah, great. Thanks for sharing. I've got one last question. So what have you done as president of your student association and what were the specific steps that you took to progress that to parliament? Um, I'll talk to talk about a few local things that I did. I think a lot of student leaders, if you're from student association, I think a lot of us can do that as well for international students is that when we talk about that financial difficulty, um, it's really hard to connect those employers who are genuine and are willing to accept international students. And, you know, when international students come in, they probably won't know who they are. So we started a work while you study event specifically catered for international students uh, where we found employers through our career services. They helped a lot. Um, so we, got them on board. We got a few other stakeholders on board as well. And we hosted that event about 150 to 200 international students were able to find jobs. And that's something that I would really, really take my, you know, like um, that's something I wanted to do all the time, but I didn't have the resources or the connections back then. But then as I became the student president, I was, I had the connections and the funding as well. So, which was really nice. And I think now it's, it's become a yearly program. So every year international students do get to participate in those programs catered for them. Um, the second one would be the ESOS bill change. Oh my God. International students are a, how do you call it? A political football right now, you know, um, with the, all the changes that's happening. It's very political driven. One of the bl blames the international students get is that they take up the housing market. And I asked a few people but like, do you happen to know any agent who would accept an international student over a family for housing here in Australia? If you do, please let me know. I'm finding housing and I couldn't find anyone who would do that. Um, and on top of that, um, the Australian Property Council also says that only 4% of the housing market is, is occupied by international students. The rest stay in share houses or uh, purpose-built accommodations. So it's driven by politics. So it, it's about bring that perspective and sharing those emotional stories sometimes helps as well. Working in data, everybody was going to throw data. Like at Senate's inquiry, everyone's like, oh, $48 billion industry, boom. And like 50% hit in the budgets for the university, boom. I'm like, what about the people involved? You know, we're talking about people who are waiting to get their visas, who are waiting to come on shore. They're just stuck in limbo. They don't know what to do. At least give them a decision. And none of these policies were grandfathered. None of these um, policies were even forecasted by Treasury. Like they didn't do the financial modeling for the country. What would happen to the country if these policies go through? It was There was a lack of grandfathering and a lack of uh, strategic thinking in these policies. So we just had to point that out, I guess. So, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jana. Everyone give a hand for Jana. I don't know if this works. Does it? No. No. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Lucy. So we've been talking a lot about student experience at universities, yet there is a big proportion of higher education students currently studying at TAFE. Different course durations and modes of study, numerous different age groups and study periods that aren't aligned with, uh, I guess, the university schedules can create difficult environments to engage students um, in governance and student life activities. SITSA is the current only student association um, in TAFE institutions. So my question for you is, 
What does the student voice look like at TAFE and how have you been shifting from a tokenistic representation to actionable representation at SITSA? And first I'll ask, who is SITSA and what role do you hold at TAFE? Those are some loaded questions. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, hi, my name's Lucy. I've had a chat to some of you today. Um, I'm just going to hit this right on the head. I am an anxious, anxious queen, you know, and and I'm a jittery, jittery gal, so please forgive me. Um, and I ramble like nothing else. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to admit it now because otherwise everyone's going to be like, why is she still rambling? Um <laughs> I just wanted to get that over. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> um, so SITSA is uh, a ACNC registered charity. Um, so we are the only uh, student association who is sitting as a non-aligned body from a TAFE. So we are a separate entity. Uh, so we run commercial services and offer support, support services to support the student support officers so we run in line with them but we don't take over their services we run to support their services that are already available um, something that we have picked up recently is we are now running the accommodation for CIT so CIT is Canberra Institute of Technology um, flash way of saying TAFE in the ACT we have to have an acronym for everything we are the capital of acronyms um, <laughs> If nothing else, I'm going to give you a laugh in this. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so what does the student voice look like at TAFE? How would you explain that? A bit of everything, really. Like, So my journey specifically, like back in 2009 um, I had undiagnosed endometriosis and I was failing hard at mainstream schooling and also had super undiagnosed uh, neurospice uh, <laughs> just wasn't computing why I hated mainstream school and then I ended up doing my year 10 at TAFE uh, because I just could not cope in school anymore and it just didn't align with my hyper fixations <laughs> just own it um and um like I was suddenly in a class where you know academically if I was interested in subjects I could perform very well and if I didn't good luck maintaining my attention because I didn't have ADHD meds back then um and you know I was in a classroom with students who range from 17 like me up until their mid-20s who had come back to do their year 10 certificate and you know a lot of the students there had been lumped as behavioral students because it's easier to say that someone is a behavioral problem rather than you know for example one of the students I was sitting with him this one day and he would come into class every day and he'd play up and you know would get kicked out of the classroom for causing a ruckus and then the day would go on. And this one day I I stepped in. So we're sitting down, we're doing our work and he starts playing up. And pardon my French, but the, the fuck you miss started. And it was, oh, get out of the class. And I, I went and sat with him. I was like, hey, dude, what, what's what's going on? Like, do you, do you need a hand? And I sat with him and that's when I picked up that he couldn't read. And this guy was 18. He had grown up in Australia and he could not read English. That wasn't his fault. We had failed him. And it's easier to play up in class and make a show of I don't want to be here because I'm too cool for this like this is below me then admit that fear of you know I'm I'm less than I'm lacking and that really sparked something in me and I worked with him and I worked with quite a few of the other students and my group was the first group of year 10s that every single student finished that year and after that, you know, some of them went on to year 12 and I was meant to go on to year 12. And 
again, mainstream really didn't interest me. I really wanted to do animal technology. And it was, oh, no, you can't do that because you don't have a year 12, you have to do year 12. And I was really lucky that I had an advocate in my youth worker and she pushed and went, well, you know, can't she do the entry test for literacy and numeracy? And I did and I passed and I got in. And I was exposed to an even more broad group of students. And it was then that, you know, I got the tap on the shoulder of, hey, I love supporting other students. I, I, I love watching people learn. I, I love, you know, seeing the growth in people when they're given a chance to flourish. So I got involved with SITSA and then I got to see all the student voices. I went out and spoke with the tradies, you know, and every different type of trade because there is so, so many. Um, and, you know, go and see, you know, the short courses that they run where, you know, there's a lady there that's in her 80s and she's got like six PhDs, but she just wants to come back and do a cooking class. Like the 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 voice at TAFE is such a broad, extensive, diverse divergent group of people and there's not a way that like yes I've been in this role twice now I, I was in the role of chair and you know student rep on the board 10 years ago and I'm back now but I know that my one voice can't cover all of them you know, like 10 years ago, I was out pounding the pavement talking to all of them, but like I still can't represent all of their voices. And to expect that is tokenistic, you know, and and for me, it's it's raising that awareness within the policymakers that like, oh, yeah, hey, look, I can give you my thoughts. And like it's 10 years worth of like views because I sat as the secretary at you know, Signa Do Student Association back at ACU in Canberra when I did my nursing. So I've, I've sat in both sides of the higher education space, but like, it's just me mm. in that. Like, I can't speak for Jana and I can't speak for Casey and I can't speak for any of you because we're all so diverse, yet we're meant to represent all of our groups. And it's having that space to acknowledge that we can't just have that hat of speaking for everyone. We have our hat of, hey, this is my experience or, you know, this is what I've seen or this is what I've heard, but it's not my story. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you yeah. so much. Round of applause for Lucy. Thank you for putting up with my rambling and bearing with me to get the message out there. Thank you. Awesome. So we actually have 15 minutes and we wanted to pass the time over to you guys. If you have any questions for our panel members, um, yeah, take the time to just raise your hand. I'll come over with a mic or, yeah, I'll come over um, or one of the orange shirts will. So we do have our first question. Che at the front. Please. Um, my question is for Lucy. So with the current changes that's going through government and everything, one of the things they're looking at is a Australian Tertiary Education Commission, ATEC. And they love the acronyms. Um, one of the things out of that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> one of the things that uh, is part of it is they're talking about harmonisation between universities and TAFEs. Do you think it will be, good to have that harmonization to benefit the students of TAFE as much as what it will to benefit uh, the students of university, like give you guys more of a voice in the TAFE realm of things? Yeah, I, one of those hard ones, like it's, you don't want to water down either side, but you want to support both. Um, but I think there would definitely be a benefit in having that harmony there. And even like the examples of our institute in the past and, you know, moving forward have had MOUs with unis to support students so they can have a further pathway in their education space. So 
for example, you know, you're doing like a Cert 3 in IT and then that continues on and then you're doing your bachelor's. Um, but then that goes back the other way of, you know, hey, I've got all these uni degrees, but I haven't got the practical skills to the level that I'd like them to. And you can go back and do like even just doing a statement of attainment, just rocking up and having that industry knowledge there. It makes such a difference. And to be able to support that space of having both institutions, you know, supported for that, I think it's worth a shot. Thank you. Are there any other questions right next door? Hi, uh, my question's for Casey. Um, thank you for your share because um, I actually um, could take away quite a bit because I'm the dis the convener dis di um, blah, sorry, of the Disabilities Collective here at the University of Sydney. And as part of the process, um, it part of the Disabilities Inclusion Action Plan implementation team, um, the thing that we come up again and again is the way that we want it, obviously we've got these lofty goals, but if university executives are only willing to go so far, if they're only willing to comply with the minimum standards, like we've asked this question again and again, does the University of Sydney want to just comply with legislation or do they want to go above and beyond and make sure that everything in this university is inclusive? And unfortunately, in a lot of the cases, it's just comply. Um, so do you have any tips and tricks or more tips and tricks on actually you know, knocking some sense into the heads of, of these people. I think that's why I show up to chancellery mid-mental breakdown post-burnout in a law exam. I walked into that office a hot damn mess, crying, and I was like, this is on you. This problem, me, is on you. Like, standards were not followed that are the base minimum standards and you need to see the potential repercussions of your lack of vigilance in maintaining the bare minimum. Continuing on from that, um, I have recently become a co-chair of Student Voice Australia's uh, Disability Leadership Collective. And that, again, is a similar uh, vein of trying to establish what are the state and national standards versus what are the university standards. And the reason why we are going to be, you know, a voice of disability leadership is so that those people who have actually experienced the system can have that voice and petition for change. I, this is the way I've uh, approached aviation for myself. I've done two internships. I said, throw me on the floor, throw me in day-to-day -day operations. Why? Because if I don't know what the day-to-day -day looks like, how can I manage something? So how can we create policy as policy makers if we have no idea what the hell is even going on? If you've never had a feeding tube, why can you tell me what I can and can't take into an exam? You're not a doctor. And this is again, an issue that I have raised with special considerations within my own institution is I hand them across high level medical documentation and their lack of ability to understand it means that they deny my special considerations. I wasn't, why am I expected to be a doctor and explain high level medical stuff? So it's for me, putting a face to the problem. I go in as a person that is disabled, that has faced these issues and I show them what it does. And by doing the comeback that I have done, I have found that making such a change has given weight to what I say because everyone knows that I have given 130% when I only had 85% to give. And so when I turn around and say, no, you didn't do this right, you screwed me over, but I still did what I needed to do, they're listening. And so not everyone has the strength and tenacity to do that, nor should they be expected to. So I think it's finding those champions amongst the challenges and sending them forth per se as the lamb to slaughter, if you want to be a better of word, because... We need these people. We need those. We need the champions amongst these challenges. And so if you've got that experience and you've seen those challenges, do not shut up. Don't sit down. Don't let them tell you how it should be when you know how it is. Awesome. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Yeah, Shay. Question for Yana, sorry. Um, would you be able to elaborate more on the, like the 
uh, international work program or the skills program to, that you got um, up on running at your university? So that was one of the many initiatives, but that one was really successful. So what we did was we contacted our career services. And so that's a part of, you know, being a student association president is that you can, you have the platform to now build strategic relationships with the key individuals. So I was um, talking to the director for career services and I was just mentioning that, you know, it'll be cool to do something. I have an idea. I'm not sure whether we have the resources, but I think I can also chip in some money. You can chip in some money. We can try to do something. And um, so what we did was then our career services usually has heaps of contacts with the industry, different areas from aged care to retail to everything. So they already have those contacts. They will, because there are people within career services, their literal job is to just talk to employers, like literal job is to, just to talk to those employers. So I, it's about tapping into those connections. And um, then we all sat together, us, um, student association, uh, career services, study Adelaide, which is like study New South Wales, um, you know, Victorians, I'm not sure, but uh, Saudi Adelaide also is a, a not-for-profit government agency uh, that helps international students. So we are all sat together and international student services as well. This is the plan. What can we do? So we ran through a design thinking session um, and then we created a map. And then over time, a long-term strategy is to have personalized support for international students in the um, career services, but short-term uh, we'll do these um, networking sessions or uh, jobs that like, they were hiring, like people were hiring on the spot as well. So um, there were some major industries that were very keen to hire international students were aged care, um, allied health services and retail. Um, so those were the three major industries that was very keen to hire international students, but also cash flow work around, like for example, uh, if there's like a major event happening um, in the in the city, they will also be looking for casuals. So the recruitment companies will also be looking for uh, international students. So it's, it's about tapping into those connections, creating an event such that, you know, it has an impact, but also making sure that it runs for every year. Yeah. Is this an initiative you think could go like national? Are you guys going to try and get it more like available to other international students across different streams? Or is this just for Uni of SA that you're with? So currently we are funded by the student services and amenities fee. Um, that, you know, all university students pay. So currently it's only within Flinders because it's funded by the Flinders fee. So that's the issue. But um, I feel like if you see this issue anywhere in the student associations, it'll be good to have a chat with the career services and see what kind of opportunities that can be, you know, looked into. And also if you are doing food programs, um, a lot of student unions will be doing food programs like emergency food assistance, financial assistance, make sure that it's visible and available for new students as well. Great. Thank you so much guys. Can everyone put a, their hands together? These amazing people. <laughs> All honestly, so amazing and so inspiring. Um, and every time, you know, we meet with them, I'm just more and more blown away, blown away by your stories. So thank you so much.